The Digital Photography Cafe show is brought to you by Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool for your camera. Welcome to the Digital Photography Cafe show. Join host Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina as they serve up the hottest photography news and commentary. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. This is episode 180. I'm Joseph Christina here with my co-host, Trevor Current. On last week's show, we did our 2015 WPPI conference wrap-up. If you haven't watched last week's show, I encourage you to do so. You can find it at digitalphotographycafe.com and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash dphotocafe. Listen with the popular Stitcher, TuneIn, and Xbox music apps, or subscribe through iTunes or RSS. So Joe, we're back. How you doing, man? We're here for yet another week. Yes. How are you doing, my friend? Yeah, doing okay. Hanging in there. Good. Nice, nice, nice. We're up to like 90 degrees here in Florida. <laughs> and up. you had, I think, <laughs> snow yesterday, day before. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, we had snow. I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm so done with the snow. Uh, <laughs> I can't even tell you. Yeah. You got to come down here. Yeah. That's all we have. Uh, every license plate is foreign. So yeah. um, you might as well bring yours down. I too. know, I know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, the sun is getting real warm. The air may be cold, but the sun is warm. So right, it's right. now it snows and it just starts melting. So my, my driveway is yeah. almost cleared already, but it, it's oh, just a pain. I'm done. I hear you. So anyways, we got a pretty good show. We got a ton of stuff. We got to jump right in. We're going to try to blast through all of this information as quick as possible, right? Yes, yes, we have a lot. Yeah, so let's start out with uh, Camera Raw 8.8 is now available. Kind of exciting. We always love when there's a new camera raw because what that means is, is if you purchase a camera as of late that currently um, did not or did not have support for uh, in within Lightroom or through Photoshop, probably now it does. And um, a little quick little rundown is they have some Casios in there, Canon. Now what's really, really nice is the big boys, of course. Canon, the EOS um, 750D. Um, which is your Rebel, as well as the 760D, um, they are now supported. So that's like one of the big uh, one of the big names. And of course, Nikon, we have to go to, can't forget Nikon, which is a D5500, yep. which is also supported, and some smaller mirrorless. Um, but one of, the, one of the big guys is that one that we talked about is the Olympus OMD E5, uh, excuse me, M5 II, that brand new one that we talked about yeah, um, from the WPPI week. show. Exactly. So that is now supported in Camera Raw 8.8. So if you do not have Camera Raw 8.8, you need to go and grab a copy. There's a bunch of others. Uh, we'll stick them into the show notes so you can see or go and download it. But also bug fixes, right? Yeah, yeah. So again, you know, Camera Raw is not really something I use. So to me, a lot of these fixes and stuff really don't mean a whole lot. Um, right. But for you guys out there using it... Um, they uh, they fix an inch, um, an issue with magenta highlights when processing right. Canon EOS seventy D raw files. So, you know, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that's probably well. That was a, that was probably one of the bigger uh, fixes because uh, yeah, you end up having these uh, these highlights that are magenta, right? And it looks like just ass and you have to go back and fix it yeah, right who yeah. wants to do that and that ends up having to do you just have to do a lot more processing you know there's just we, we don't have time to do that so when they go and fix these things that are problematic like you have to grab it i'm not a proponent of updating um software just a minute that it comes out because you don't know what what else it'll break right um but when it comes to these type of things and if your bug is in there and they just you know they discovered it and they you know, address it. You need to download it right away. This is just going to save time, and that's it. There's a bunch of other things in there. There's just vignette problems. Yeah, this vignette overcorrection seems to be an issue yeah. with a lot of the different camera bodies and lens combinations here. So um, right. definitely, if you were having problems with that, um, definitely check this out. Yeah, because seek it, this the, addresses multiple cameras. Right. Seek the 8.8 .8, um, camera raw. So, anyways, moving on. So this is kind of interesting. There's. Um, there's a new kind of rumor, let's say, floating around about the next version of Lightroom. Yeah. So traditionally, when a camera raw upgrade is introduced, you usually get the upgrade uh, pushed through Lightroom around the same time. Exactly. Um, that didn't happen this time. Um, it's, it seems that the Lightroom um, is not available as of yet, as of the time that we're recording. Um, and the reason being, the rumored reason being, is that there are leaks of Lightroom 6 coming out 
um, that obviously will have some you know new features, improvements, fixes, things like that. Um, that will most likely roll these these uh, camera raw update um, additions into this new Lightroom Six. So yeah. with that rumor of Lightroom Six that we found, um, it looks like there's going to be some additional features that they're adding, like multi-image HDR is now going to be built into Lightroom. Um, stitching multiple images together in panoramas, which is kind of cool. Uh, right. Face recognition. But I think the one that is uh, probably most exciting to to probably everybody is the use of the GPU for um, accelerated processing of RAW files. Yeah, I know if you're a photographer out there using Lightroom, you know sometimes how long it takes to, let's say, bring in a wedding and let it do its crunching and churning and what it does. One thousand to, uh, plus thousand, images or two thousand. Yeah. And as these raw images <clears throat> get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, it just churns longer and longer and longer. And as your catalog becomes larger and your database basically becomes larger, it churns for even longer right. then. So, um, right. you know, that's more on the CPU side, but the GPU side is for those instant, like just showing these previews. And uh, But whenever you're dealing with a GPU, there's a lot of processing that goes on because you're offloading then onloading, offloading yep. and onloading, and uh, it is a it's it's a technique. I mean, there's a lot of there's programming that has to be done with it. So I can see how they pushed it into Lightroom six. Now the thing that kind of worries me is in this rumor escape um, is they were talking about it finally going to a CC only for six. And this we right. talked about. I know Trev like probably six when it first came out. We said you know what. Just give it a minute. Just give it a minute. Yeah. They're gonna they're gonna go CC with Lightroom, and that's gonna be the end of it. You're not gonna be able to buy it anymore, and end game kind of thing. And then we did an entire show just on alternatives because you guys right. wanted to know. So that's gonna be an issue. I love these um, improvements, but whenever they do major improvements or major additions, that's when they they find the need to bring in CC and yeah. force you to get into a subscription based model. Um, based on that, all that extra work they did kind of thing. So this yeah. might be- <laughs> this, this will update. be like the clencher. This will be yeah. finally what um, allows them to push all of the Lightroom standalone owners over to Creative Cloud because right. they're going to be adding enough uh, new features, um, I think specifically the GPU acceleration. Yeah, that's, that's um, huge, yeah. That, that people, you know, pros that have these huge libraries that are really power users- that have been using the standalone version are going to say, oh my God, you know, I've been waiting for GPU acceleration. Now I really need Lightroom 6 for my workflow to speed things up. So yep. I guess now I'm going to have to bite the bullet and go over to the subscription. So, yeah, you know, we'll wait and monthly. see. I mean, again, it's rumored. We don't know for sure. Um, I mean, we have suspected for quite some time, though, that they're going to eventually um, push it all over to CC. So, yeah, so we'll see. Creative Cloud might be right around the corner for everyone. Um, well, I don't know. We'll we'll see what we'll see what ends up happening. Yep. You know, for for me, I'm I, I haven't gone CC with the studio as of yet, but you know, who knows? This might be like we're saying the the thing that does it. So moving on um, into the Apple uh, world, um, USB C. What do you think? What do you think with the new MacBooks? Yeah. So while you know during the the week of our WPPI announcement coming out or WPPI recap coming out. Um, Apple had an event where they introduced some new MacBooks. Um, they announced the official delivery date and pre-order date of the Apple Watch. Um, a few other things that, that are going on. Um, but uh, the I would say probably the biggest thing that came out of it is this new USB-C connector that is now available in the MacBooks. Right, um, right. The MacBooks now are like, you know, the aluminum body, you can get them in gold and that kind of that space gray, I think they call it in silver, you know, right. to, kind of basically matching the iPhone look. Um, but this USB-C connector actually does um, power, data and video over one plug. So this right. computer it only has one plug in it, which is I mean, I'm not real thrilled about that, Joe. I know you're not at all. Yeah. Um, well, you know what it is. I mean, it's good and it's bad. Uh, Apple has always strived for simplicity, right. and that's what they—that's what you get with Apple. Right. You know, they really tried to bring it down to 
um, you know, they, they, they couple it down, nuts and bolts, just to get rid of everything, make it very plain and simple and easy for everyone to use. One connector is awesome, right? Sure. Um, I personally like, you know, the MagSafe connector for, for power. I'm, I, I, it's a preference. I've seen too many people rip out their cable over and over and over and over. Yep. And then all of a sudden you end up with a problem with the computer. This little, the little magnet, you know, you stick it on. It doesn't matter if it's right side up, upside down. There is no right side up or upside yeah. down. It just, once it sticks, it's, it's charging. I am not a fan of everything and all in one connector because now look, you know, let's say you have a MacBook or you know, let's say we have the Air or whatever it is and you have one connector. Well, what does, what does this mean? Okay, so you have your power on, right? Well, how about your mouse? How about uh, your Wacom tablet? How about yep. your um, your printer? How about, I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wireless. You can go Bluetooth in the mouth instead of, you, uh, you know, USB. You can go wireless on a printer instead of, there's a lot of things that you can do. But the thing is, is you need, like maybe your backup. Where do you stick your backup? You need you need to you connect. Need so what does that mean? You need what? A dongle hanging off yeah. this thing now, right? Or yeah, you need a $79 kind of- dongo, dongle, no less. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, and it's almost going to be required. It's a, you could just yeah. stick it right into the price. If they don't give it to you, you're going to need it. Yeah, it um, doesn't come so, in the box, and that really is the thing. So if you want to have these added ports, you basically need a dock, uh, you know, right. like a hub of some sort. That you know, there are going to be lots of them coming out, or you need this Apple proprietary dongle. Um, so yeah. I mean, that does it does limit yeah. you. Um, but again, you know, this I mean, connector. I mean, this connector is bad, though. I mean, it supports 4K display through it. I mean, there's a lot. It's a lot of cool stuff in this oh, single yeah, connector. Yeah. Um, but still, it's still a single connector. It's still, I mean, it'd be nice to have, even yeah. if they want to do all the stuff through one port, I mean, or, you know, through one connector type, um, at least put two ports, one on each put two. side. You know, yeah, then something. at least it gives you the ability to run power out of one. You know, you can plug one other device into the other side or plug into a hub at that point. I mean, they're, so Apple's mindset, I think, behind this, obviously, is simplicity and design. Um, they wanted to get real thin with the MacBook, um, you know, with the MacBook, and they wanted to, um, you know, really kind of just say that, you know, this is your all-day type of computer battery life now. You right. know, we... Um, we don't expect you to need to plug in. Um, you know, we want to just get you, you know, out and about, use it when you get home, plug it in, then worry about that stuff then, you know, right. so, you know, and it's geared more for the person that doesn't need the peripherals, you know, that aren't really doing a lot of extra work, you know, more for the, the college student or the high school kid that just, you know, needs to type up a paper and they're connected wireless to their internet anyway. And, you know, they're sitting on the couch rather than at a desk with a plug. And, you know, yeah, I mean, they're, yeah. it's it's designed to be that mobile computer. So. Yeah, but even MacBook Air, which is designed for just what you're saying, yep. it has Thunderbolt. It has an SD card yep. uh, reader in it. It has USB on each side. It has, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. that I They're, they're going to end up rethinking this. I guarantee I you this will, be, this will be V1, V2. We'll end up with a couple other uh, connectors in there. So right. it's, it's sticking with Apple, right? What do you yep. think into into Android? Um, and uh, I, I don't know. What do you think about this story with this whole um, this trade in program that Apple is doing? Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of interesting too. So Apple now Apple's had a trade up program where you could bring in your old iPhone and they would give you X amount of dollars, well, you know, whatever it was worth based on the model and the shape that right. it was in towards the purchase of a new iPhone. Um, we took advantage of that for my wife with her upgrade. She went from the 4S to the 5S and we got a lot of money for it. We wound up getting the 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 phone basically for free. Right. Um, so it, it really worked out uh, well. That was a good deal. Well, now on the heels of the official Apple Watch release date, um, Apple knows that people are going to want the watch just because, a fashion accessory, right. whatever. But the watch only works with an iPhone. So right. there's a lot of people out there with other forms of smartphones that very well may want the watch and be like, oh, no, I can't get it. And right, oh, no, right. sure you can, because now we got this new program in place. We'll take your old smartphone. We'll give you fair market value for it. You know, our our staff will evaluate it and what it's worth. And we'll give you a credit on a card, a store card that you can apply towards the purchase of your iPhone 
and watch <laughs> yeah yeah it's yeah here's a watch grab a watch i don't know so yeah, yeah you never would see apple do this you know all the you know, you know you have samsung you have all the all of the all of the folks on the android side that was a trade in your trade in your iphones trade in your iphones we'll yeah. give you this and we'll give you that it's we'll basically like the switcher campaign all over again yeah but for for apple to do that is really kind of strange you just you just never i would never peg them to do that but yeah it could just be um the watch thing you know you need to have an iphone in your pocket to use the watch properly right so i don't know how good this watch is going to go over i know i know you like i know you would like to get uh get one i don't know for Eh. me i'm I, i don't know i i probably will just stick with uh you know my watches i i don't think i, I like it that. as a novelty item i mean yeah, other than and that, that's it yeah other than that i mean i really don't think that i would use it a whole lot i mean right. if i had it i would use it am i going to run out and drop 350 bucks right yeah. away for the the base watch eh, right. i don't think so i mean yeah. if somebody wanted to get it for me for a gift for my birthday yeah, my wife <laughs> intent, you're, anyone you're, listening you're listening yeah. um that's right you know and then i you know that's great i would be happy to take it but i don't know that i would run out and spend my money on it let alone yeah. the the edition version of like fifteen thousand dollars yeah yeah, yeah 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 the nice one yeah well that. Yeah. Well, moving on, Flickr. We talked last week about Flickr. We, we, you know, sometimes they come up in conversation um, about things that they've done in the past, stripping of metadata and all kinds of other stuff. And um, Flickr uh, ended up join, joining forces with Getty Images to basically sell your images, right? To right. license them right. off, which was a really great thing. Um, and a lot of folks like myself got, you know, the email, hey, you know, go ahead and sell your your photos uh, through Getty now, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Well, they were, they no longer are connected as of, uh, I guess it is a year now or so, just about. Um, and uh, now they've kind of been doing their own thing for this last year. But what's interesting is now they're talking about this brand new rollout of this more powerful search engine that has better filtering and whatnot that now um you know has the albums and photo streams and people you know and there's all different ways of finding images you can find images based on color based on size based on orientation i mean you know google's done this forever but anyway so Flickr is, is doing this and it kind of makes me think you know what exactly is going on with Flickr? yeah what's said, their you know, motivation to do this they're, they're not doing well um, I don't think as they used to, you know, they used to be, but what is the motivation? You know, is there someone else coming on board? Is there another one of these licensing companies that are saying, Hey, you know, we want to jump on where Getty was in there. We want to do it, but you need to revamp this database. This thing's a mess. This is a hot right, mess. Right. Um, and maybe they did that and now they're rolling out, um, kind of beta or behind the scenes, you know, so that people can kind of test it without you really knowing what you're testing. So yeah. I'm, you know, I'm just speculating, but there's got to be some reason for this. Yeah, or, just or maybe because. they're going to try and become a stock house themselves, you know, Flickr stock photography. You know, it's, it's, it's very possible. possible. I mean, they have the images, they have a user base. Um, right. We know a lot of creatives go to, you know, like designers go to Flickr to look for images um, to either license or to use under Creative Commons. Um, you know, whenever, so this is my concern, whenever a company makes it easy to search images, um, unless these images are watermarked, it becomes that much easier for people to steal them. So, you know, what is the motivation behind it? So like Google images, um, you put anything online and it's going to get indexed as an image and whatever metadata it can pull from that image is going to show up in Google image search. And we know that that this is what people use to steal images. So if you're going to put images online, you got to watermark them. You got to do all the stuff that we've talked about over and over and over and over again. Um, So either Flickr, I don't think Flickr is building this search engine to make it easier for the users to find other users' images. I don't think they're making it for create easier for creatives to come in and find images of these photographers to potentially license or whatever. I think you're right. I think this is going to be some um, behind the scenes infrastructure for some sort of uh, stock. Yeah, like a licensing play of some kind. 
Yeah, I I believe so. So I mean, it's interesting. We'll see what it ends is, up yeah. happening. You know, Flickr's been around forever. Hopefully, they they stay around. You know, we don't need um, any vacuums. Um, you know, where someone else that might not do a good job just jumps in. And we've seen a lot of that happen in the last couple of years. Too many vacuums. Right. So, anyways, right. before we go any further, we got a lot more for you guys. Let's go ahead and take a quick break to hear from one of our sponsors. Are you frustrated with slightly out of focus images when you know your autofocus spot was dead on? It's simply not your fault. From manufacturer to manufacturer, and even lens copy to lens copy, there are slight variances to the exact spot where light is being focused onto the sensor. Finally, there's a product that allows you to compensate for those variances and make sharper images immediately. Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool, is an absolute must for every photographer. If you want to make the sharpest images possible, then you need to take control over your camera's focusing system. With the Focus Pyramid, you can calibrate all of your lenses on your lunch break. The Focus Pyramid makes lens calibration quick and easy at an affordable price. So give your lenses a new lease on life and take your photography to the next level. Head over to focuspyramid.com forward slash DPC and get an additional 10% off just for being a show listener. All right, so we're back and we have an interesting story here for, about Amazon and their prime delivery that they're talking about doing with drones. Yeah. Um, FAA has give, given them the, um, the green light to start experimenting with this service, which right. is really kind of interesting, right? Yeah, I, I I like it. It's kind of kind of cool. I, I don't know. It's like iRobot or something. You know, we got, you're gonna have like uh, these drones uh, coming to your doorstep and dropping off a package and flying Parachuting away, shooting them um, down. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, if this does come to pa- come to pass, they're going to. Um, you know, I sell through Amazon, so there's there's currently guys like I think it's like three or four depots where you can send your products uh, for um, housing. For them to sell as right. a prime, um, a prime seller like I am, um, so I'm going to guess that if they do this, instead of having four, let's say there'll be 400 or 800 yeah. or a thousand small little locations where they're trucking these things to, and then from those little, you know, flight depots, they'd be flying the product out or something. You know, maybe it's only up to one pound. Maybe it's like memory modules or you know whatever. Yeah, it well, is, it's, it's going to be only certain products, certain size, certain weight. Um, right. certain quantity of products even. Sure. But yeah, this was really cool. I mean, um, they there's a there was a really cool video online where they showed kind of like what the future of Amazon would be and they were showing this and the idea of it is really cool. Um, the right. actual practicality of it you know, how many of these drones are going to get shot yeah, out in the sky? And, you know, yeah, and mean, it's funny you bring that up. That video was not um, filmed in the U.S. because of FAA rules and regulations. Yeah, yeah. So that cool video that everyone looks at is not even filmed here. Yeah. And the thing is, it was kind of like um, this, this, you know, granting of permission to start testing is kind of, it is and it isn't because, you know, it allows them to test on their own ground, you know, doing basic things. But then the caveat to that or the limitation is that the the pilot has to be like a licensed pilot and they yeah. need to have a certificate of medical, you know, certification. And they need all of this stuff that basically makes commercial use of this idea just you know, no one. It's, it's going to be tough. I mean, and the reason yeah. this is interesting is because of how it applies to us photographers that want to do aerial drone photography. We talked about right. the real estate person that got granted license um, a while back or, or the photographer, you know, the real estate right. photographer that got granted uh, permission to do it. So, you know, I mean, this is good. This is interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how this goes. Um I don't know. I, I know yeah. they won't be able to land one of them babies by my house, though. There's too many trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. yeah, that would not be good. That would not be good. So anyways, moving on. Um, Apple's Final Cut um, Pro, you know, I don't know. For me, FCP um, was always my go-to when it came to video. And then when they went from 7 to this Pro, this X version, and as I always call it, the neutered version, right. um, when they just, they just, Ugh, they turned it into um, iMovie on crack, which was extremely upsetting. And by hordes um, of movie, you know, editors went to Avid, 
um, for the most part. Uh, yeah, or Premiere. For, for editing, or Premiere, but yeah. the majority of them went over to Avid. But regardless, uh, they're saying that, hey, listen, Final Cut Pro is resurrected, guys, and not only is it resurrected, we're going to allow you to do a behind the scenes of this resurrection um, with the movie called Focus, that brand new Focus with Will uh, Smith. So um, it's kind of interesting. This is definitely an interesting play by Apple. And it's really kind of odd, you know, especially since we've been seeing them kind of move away from the professional market and go more consumer, 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 and just shun the pros. Um, maybe they're not shunning video now. They we're definitely shunning uh, photo by going to this new uh, photos um, app comparison to, um, you know, Aperture, which they just yeah. killed. Yeah. So, and, well, and I mean, they have to justify that five thousand dollar Mac Pro coffee can that we yeah the about coffee too. maker. You know the, I mean that machine is not built for your average user. I mean that no. machine is built for the photo, you know, the video editor, you know, right. the the animator, the people that are doing really intense uh, computing, and you know, I mean, I think it may, I think it makes sense for Apple to focus on the video and really become the number one again as far yeah. as video goes because that's where they're going to sell their pro machines. Um, they are super fast. I mean, these are awesome machines, but the average person just can't afford it. Right. So um, if they can, if they plan on continuing to be in that Mac Pro uh, market and sell these high high end CPUs then they need a product that's going to support it because the average or that you're going to need it for because the average person just won't buy it anymore. Right, right. You know, and their selling point here um, uh, to Warner Brothers was, listen, let's go ahead and try this. And Warner Brothers said, okay, you know what? We're going to go ahead and try this. But what we're going to do is we're going to do a um, in tandem uh, edit with our Avid. Um, right. because they are just, everything is in Avid. So, and if we do not have any hiccups um, in Final Cut Pro, we're gonna, we'll go and release that version. And they ended up having no hiccups. Yeah. And the focus- Yeah, that's big, see, that's huge. Yeah, you see in the movie theater is now actually edited through um, you know, FCP. Now, the, the major, the major um, impact here or the major updates was the ability to not have to transcode and proxy everything. And some of you guys are video, you understand that. If you don't, basically what that means is when you bring in all of your videos, um, it sits there and churns them and churns, like for example, with Premiere, yeah, it'll churn and churn and churn until they make it, they make them into videos that it can use for previewing and whatnot. Um, now with the new, um, uh, Final Cut Pro X, you don't need to do that. It can take native 2K plus video and not transcode and be able to immediately start editing. So what does this help? This is, it's, it's, it's good for the movie maker, but it's even better for episodic TV, you know, where they're doing a turnaround, a turn and burn of 10 days, right. where they're filming and the thing is out there in 10 days to or not have web to sit series. there web series absolutely so it's um it looks very interesting you know I, I i turned away i shunned my you know final cut pro uh once they did move into i still have seven and, and whatnot which i don't use um and everyone knows i'm sure i use premiere and even for this show um but i might go and grab a copy again of final cut uh, pro x and see you know see how it goes but i'll let you guys know if i do if i do do that so um we'll see you know uh, we'll see what ends up happening with it yeah so there was an article over on uh, Photo Focus that we, that we saw that we found kind of interesting and kind of goes along with all this stuff that we've talked about in the past about these mirrorless cameras and, you know, the professional is eventually going to be using them, you know, in whatever right. format the body ends up in for the pro. And they right. had this article uh, titled, uh, Why I Made the Switch from the 5D Mark III to the Fuji X-T1. Right. And... Uh, and it was kind of interesting, this guy's thought process behind it and what his needs were and why he went through and actually made the switch and got rid of all of his expensive Canon gear in favor of this Fuji gear. Yeah, so if you don't know that this Canon, the, 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 the Canon that he used was that 5D Mark III. What he moved to was the Fuji X-T1. The X-T1 is um, a 16 
a megapixel camera. It, it has a really a very lengthy stat list. It's a really decent camera, really good. It does full HD video. It is a, uh, it is comparison to the 5D Mark III. The difference is it's not a full frame camera. Um, you know, his idea here is very similar to mine. Wait, wait, wait. You know, weight is such a major issue when yeah, you do sure. lots of, um, you know, uh, 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 doing events and you're doing a lot of things where you're carrying around heavy, heavy gear. It just, it takes a toll. I mean, I've been doing this 20 plus years and it literally, when I get home, the, the, I'm okay. The following day, things hurt, yeah. you know, from running around, you know, you're squatting, you're on one knee, you know, you're up in the air on a ladder, you're doing, you know, constantly crazy stuff and you have a bracket and you got the camera and the body and the, the lenses and I also like he shoot the 5D so you know when you throw on the, a 5D with a you know a 70 to 200 or a 24 to 7 you're like you know you're up to 5, 6, 8 pounds with the bracket and whatnot. Yeah, that's yeah. heavy one handed and you know hanging all over you know hanging from ladders so you know his idea was his lifestyle changed his photography maybe not you know didn't change so much but it was the idea can I go and switch um, you know he he was talking about spending you know ten thousand plus dollars um, on the photo on the gear for the 5D Mark III on the camera the camera body is like over three thousand dollars and all the lenses and everything now basically instead of thirty four hundred dollars for a camera he can get a camera which he did for like thirteen hundred bucks right. Um, you know, so he got into that and he starts, you know, uh, kind of going back and forth of what he did, what he didn't do. But it's very interesting just to see that, you know, for example, to get a 1.2 85 millimeter, whereas on this camera, it would be, um, you know, obviously about a 50 or so that, that converts up to it. But um, to get that same uh, setup for a 1.2, you're looking at 1.8 pounds to like four and a half pounds or something, over four pounds. Yeah. That's a huge difference, right, Trav? Yeah, that's a lot. And he even talks about riding his motorcycle and bringing his gear with it on, uh, you know, with him in a backpack and stuff. And, right. and being able to cut your, your gear weight down in that type of scenario by half. I mean, that's huge when you're riding a bike. And, you know, you're throwing a bag in a car. I mean, it's no big deal. But, you know, it really is about portability. Um, it is about, right. you know, um, perception. I mean, we have talked about perception with these smaller bodies and whether you would be perceived as a professional. Um, mm -hmm. and, and probably over time, as these smaller formatted bodies become the norm, um, right. that perception will change. You know, the pro will no longer have to have these big, huge bodies in order to be thought of as a pro. Um, right. You know, they'll be able to get away with Because the fact of the matter is, I mean, Joe, you even said this. I mean, it, even if you were shooting with one of these small formatted bodies doing your events, you would still want your bracket with your flash on it and stuff because yeah, sure. of the performance benefits that you get out of it. So that's right. still going to set you apart from Uncle Buck that's standing there with his, you know, body, the same thing, holding it up to his eyeball and, and clicking yeah. away, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I see his point and how, how he's going with this. One of the major things that I've talked about in the past is being able to shoot out in daylight, you know, sun. He was talking yeah. about being in Vegas and shooting at 1.2. And how do you do that with uh, a camera that only goes to one eight thousandths of a second shutter speed? Whereas this new Fuji, you know, that thing could shoot at one, um, what is it, 32 thousandth of a second. Yeah. So you can actually use the camera wide open with this, you know, silent mirrorless shutter at that type of speeds. So there's a lot of positives. There's some negatives also, obviously, to going uh, this route. Sure. But yeah, like you, like you said, I mean, perception, perception, perception. One of the things that he did discuss in the article was, hey, you know, I brought it out. I brought it out and people said, oh, you downgraded your equipment? I mean, that's the, yeah. the perceived, you know, when you look yeah, at it yeah, and yeah. it's like the smaller body, the smaller everything. He's like, oh, you downgraded. Yeah. It's like, no, I didn't downgrade. The images look identical. It's just, it's a smaller form factor, but people right. are still not at that, you know, in that mindset yet. No. We, I've said it many times in the past. I would say within three years, probably, maybe even less, all pros will be using mirrorless. That's just, I think, where the technology is going to go. I said it from right. the very beginning when mirrorless came out. There's too many positives with mirrorless that we need to continue to have the shutter snapping around inside of these bodies, taking up room and making 
making noise right. um, that yeah. they, need to, they need to go. You whether, know? whether that pro camera or, or whether the pro's camera will be that smaller form factor like what we're looking at now or whether they'll make a more pro version of a body that's maybe a little beefier, a little bit easier to hold. Uh, right. Maybe it's got... Um, a compartment built into it for more batteries or something like that. So it gives it a little bit more bulk. But right. the the idea is is that you won't have to have such a huge body with this type of technology. So Right. Absolutely. And if you need full frame, I mean Sony is already there with the yep. A7 mirrorless, right? That they'll give and you There's a full lot of people frame. liking that Sony camera too. They're really liking it. They had some problems at the beginning, which yep. they should. Yep. I mean, rightfully so. You never buy V1. I'm not a V1 guy, you know, wait for V2, wait for yeah. V3. But um rumored out there guys also is Nikon has a couple of patents that are uh, patent pendings that are out there right now that definitely point them to a mirrorless full frame and that's Nikon so yeah. if Nikon's doing it you know Canon is doing it everyone is doing it everybody's so working what, on it so very very soon we're going to see that and uh, I'm kind of happy about it I would love to get rid of this big year and as you're saying with form factor and size the size might be you know bigger because look you know instead of having CF cards CF cards are dead they shouldn't even be putting them in these things anymore they should be SDs period yeah. because to put two SDs in a body so you can have backup or extended um use more more shots is very it's very small that that writer whereas yeah. if you put two cf cards in a body it's huge that's a, that's yeah. one of the major you could problems. have two sds for one cf card basically yeah exactly you could have four sds in it for yeah. the same thing so um that's going to um kind of remove space and make these um smaller and i mean i don't say i don't think putting more batteries in it i think battery grip is a great way to go sure throw a grip um on it. and you know but there's going to be other stuff, other components um, that will go into these cameras. So um, they probably will be a little bit bigger on the pro side, not but just not as big as they currently are. Right. So right. we'll see. You know, it's it, we'll be still here talking to you guys about it, and then we'll we'll, we'll let you know what ends up happening. But uh, right. I like I I love the mirrorless technology. I love where they're going with it. I've seen I saw so much when we're over at um, the WPPI Expo. Uh, just they're really doing some great stuff 4k on these things are amazing oh, even yeah. an APS-C sensor they're just just killer you can pull 4k video and then pull out a single frame and print that at an 8x10 and you can't even you know you wouldn't even know that this was out of video it's unbelievable yeah. so um a lot of cool things are going on in that whole space so yeah anyways absolutely. we need to get out of here Yes, we do. So if people want to connect with you outside of the show, uh, what's the best way for them to reach you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, and that's at Joseph Christina, and that's Christina without an H. Great, and you can connect with me on Twitter. It's at Trevor Current. So, all right, everyone, we are out of here for yet another week. You can get all the show notes from this episode by visiting digitalphotographycafe.com forward slash 180. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash D Photo Cafe or call our comment line 440-345-6707. Once again, that's 440-345-6707. And we will see you next week. You've been watching the Digital Photography Cafe show with Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina. Subscribe to our YouTube channel with any compatible device by visiting youtube.com forward slash Defoto Cafe. Be sure to subscribe to our audio feed through iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Xbox Music apps or through RSS. Visit digitalphotographycafe.com for show notes and to connect with your host. <laughs> <laughs>